Hi, I'm Robert Muchamore. Welcome to my Hay Festival 2021 virtual event. As an internationally acclaimed and best-selling children's author, one of the questions that kids ask me most is, if you're such a big name author, if you've sold so many books, how come I've never heard of you and nobody I know has read any of your books? Now, I find this question really annoying, so I'm going to try and answer it for you. And I'm gonna start off by talking about who I am, where I came from, why I decided to become a writer, and why in particular I decided to try and write the kind of books that I now write for young people. Then to finish the session off, I'm gonna do a little talk about my new series, which is called Robert Muchamore's Robin Hood. And I'll finish off by doing a reading from my latest Robin Hood book. In the beginning, there was the Big Bang. Then the earth formed and cooled from molten lava, and then the dinosaurs came. And then in 1972, something exciting finally happened, and I was born. This is the very first picture ever taken of me. As you can see, I'm about 10 minutes old and I've just been born. I grew up in a place in North London called Tufnell Park and I came from a very ordinary family. My mum was a cleaning lady, my dad was a milkman. I grew up in a big family house. I was surrounded by loads of relatives. We all lived together in the same street. I was a geeky kid. I was the kind of kid who always had his nose in a book and I was useless at football. And if they were picking teams, you could guarantee that I was always the kid that got picked last. And by the time I was about 12 or 13 years old, I decided what I thought I wanted to do with my life. I wanted to become an architect and design amazing buildings. But I had a big problem. And the biggest problem was I'm not actually that clever. And to become an architect, you need to be really smart. You need to get into a very competitive place at university to get on a course to become an architect. And when you do get on the course, unlike most things you study at university that take three years, becoming an architect takes seven years. Unfortunately, I failed all of my A-level exams and I didn't get into university at all. So I decided that I was gonna do something that didn't need any formal qualifications at all and I was going to become a writer. I was in my late teens and I had already decided what I wanted to do with my life. I was going to be a writer and I knew what kind of book I wanted to write. At that time in my life, the thing I enjoyed reading most was what we would call now serious literary fiction. Books written by people like uh, Joseph Heller, who wrote my favourite book, Catch-22, or Hilary Mantel, or Kazuo Ishigaru. And I was going to be this celebrated, famous literary writer. I was going to win myself a Booker Prize for my fiction. I was going to go to America and win a Pulitzer Prize for my journalism. I was even going to dabble in the movies and maybe win myself a couple of Oscars. Everything was going to be great. I was gonna be rich. I was gonna have a celebrity lifestyle. I was gonna have a house on the beach. I was gonna go to wild parties every night and I was gonna live this amazing lifestyle. That was my fantasy when I was a teenager. But I can tell you, it didn't happen. And do you know why it didn't happen? because everything that I wrote was terrible. Now, this is not a tips video. I know lots of young people who want to be writers are interested in writing tips, and you can find some writing tips on my website, and you can also find a tips video that I made some years ago on my YouTube channel. But I am gonna digress and just give you one tip, because this is based on the biggest mistake that I made in my entire writing career. The mistake that I made was that I focused too much on writing one kind of book, and it was a kind of book that I wasn't very good at. So what I would tell you is, if you wanna be a writer, say you wanna be a writer and you love reading science fiction books, 
and you want to write science fiction. Now, there's nothing wrong with that, but to get better at being a writer, what I suggest everybody does is move out of their comfort zone and try doing lots of different things. So what I mean by that is you try reading lots of different books. Maybe you read as well as sci-fi, you read literary fiction, you read romance, you might read a little kid's book, you might read an adventure story. And by reading and learning about all those different types of stories and how they're put together, you become a better writer. And that was the big mistake that I made. I got very bogged down trying to write this one type of book. And unfortunately, it was something I wasn't very good at. So 10 years of my life went by. I almost felt like writing was a waste of time. I got a job when I was about 19, working for a firm of air hunters. That is a company that finds and traces missing beneficiaries when someone dies and you don't know who gets their money. And I was heading into my late 20s and I was just thinking being a writer was just a childish fantasy. Because let's face it, when we're kids, everyone thinks about what they want to be and they all come up with these very desirable jobs. They think of things like being a football player or a YouTube star or an actor. And most people don't end up doing those jobs. Most people end up doing things like being a surveyor or being a builder or being a teacher or stuff like that. And I bet you if you go home today and you ask adults that you know, did they end up doing the thing that they wanted to be when they were a kid? The vast majority of them would say, no, they did not. And I just thought, I'm grown up now, I'm an ordinary person, I'm doing a job, and I'm just gonna be doing this job for the rest of my life. But then something happened that changed my attitude to writing and changed the kind of book that I thought I wanted to write. And this happened when I went on a trip to Australia to visit my sister, and my three little nephews. So I saved up all my money and I saved up all my leave from work and I found myself in Australia staying at my sister's house. And my sister had three kids and the two little guys, they were as happy as could be running around the house and just generally having fun. But my oldest nephew, Jared, he was a much more interesting case. He was 13 and he was just getting to the kind of age where he liked laying in bed in the morning, he liked hanging out with his mates. And it was the school Easter holidays. So some of the time, like mostly in the school holidays, Jared was a bit bored. And I thought I'd be a nice uncle. One day I turned around to Jared and I said, Look mate, next time we go to the shopping centre, I'll buy you a book so you've got something to do during your holiday. And at this point, Jared gave me one of those scornful looks that teenagers are so good at. He just sort of looks at me and he goes, I don't like books, books are really boring. And I was shocked because I was the kind of kid who loved books. I was the kind of kid who loved reading absolutely everything. And I just thought, you know, I am an adult, I know best. I'm gonna take Jared to the bookshop, I'm gonna buy him a book to read, and I'm gonna introduce Jared to the wonderful world of reading. But that isn't what happened. What did happen was a couple of days later, I borrowed my sister's car and we went to the shops. We started looking at the kids' books in the bookshop and there were quite a lot of fantasy type books. Harry Potter had really taken off and was quite popular at this time. And there were adventure stories, but they tended to be, you know, not very cool. They tended to be quite simplistic and they seemed to be aimed at kids quite a lot younger than Jared. And no matter how hard I kept studying these books in this bookshop, I just could not find anything that I thought Jared would want to read. And Jared was heartily in agreement. And he said that since I couldn't find him a book, I now had to buy him a PlayStation game. So driving home from my sister's house, I wasn't very happy because I'd spent $100 on a PlayStation game instead of 10 or $15 on the book that I was hoping to buy my nephew. I'd been proved wrong by a surly 13 year old and I was in a bad mood. But as I was driving, something occurred to me. And the thing that occurred to me was, all my life, I had wanted to be 
a writer. But the most difficult thing was, I tried to write books that I wasn't very good at, and I didn't feel I had any original thought. I didn't feel I had any kind of edge, or that I could write anything that lots of other people before me hadn't thought of before. I was going to write the book that I hadn't been able to find for Jared in the bookstore. I was going to write a cool book for teenagers. My big idea was to make books for the kind of reluctant readers who think that most books and that reading is lame. And I came up with three key things that I thought would actually help with this. The first one wasn't about the book, it was about the cover. I noticed that when my nephew picked up a book, he found the covers quite babyish, and he thought they were a lot less cool than the covers of his video games or the stuff in the skateboarding magazines that he read. So I knew my books would have to have cool covers that look more like an adult thriller than they would look like a kid's book. The second point that I noticed was Jared didn't like anything that was too much of a fantasy or that was too unrealistic. So I decided that my stories were going to be about believable characters and they were going to be set in the real world. And the third thing that I really noticed was Jared liked watching soap operas and stories about people his own age. So I wanted to have believable characters and I wanted to have situations where my readers could feel that this was something that could really happen to them. So this is my very first book, Cherub the Recruit, which was published in 2004. And just to give you an idea of what my Cherub series is all about, I'm just going to read you the blurb off of the back cover. A terrorist doesn't let strangers into her flat because they might be undercover police or intelligence agents. But her children bring their mates home and they run all over the place. The terrorist doesn't know that one of these kids has bugged every room in her house, made copies of all of her computer files and stolen her address book. The kid works for Cherub. Cherub agents are aged between 10 and 17 years. They live in the real world slipping under adult radar and getting information that sends criminals and terrorists to jail. For official purposes, these children do not exist. Getting my first book published was a really special feeling. And when The Recruit first came out, it was so exciting. I remember the first time I saw the cover design. I remember the first time I went in a bookshop and saw my book with my name on the cover in a real bookshop. And I showed it to all my friends and I bought copies for my mum and all my family and everyone was really excited. Robert's got a book published, isn't this amazing? But I actually realised that once a book is published, that's when the hard work really starts because nobody knew who I was. Thousands of books get published every year and taking your book from just being an idea and just getting published into being something really successful is a hard slog. And over the next few years I worked really hard, I wrote more Cherub books, but I started to get a sense maybe that nobody was buying them, but nobody was very enthusiastic. But things started to change. I started getting lots of emails from fans telling me that they liked the books. I started hearing from school librarians who actually thought my books were really good because they actually worked and encouraged kids to read who didn't normally like books. And that was brilliant because that was the very thing that I'd set out to do to encourage my own nephew to read. So the books were working and they started selling more copies. And about two or three years after my first book was published, there were six Cherub books on sale. And the first one for the first time, I think it was the sixth one in the series, hit the bestseller list. And suddenly I was on a roll and everything was going incredibly well. So far, we have sold over 15 million Cherub books. There are 17 books in the series and it's been published in 26 different languages. I also compiled some fun statistics. If you took all the ink needed to print 15 million Cherub books, it would fill up six gigantic petrol tankers. And if you stacked all of the Cherub books that have ever been sold into one big pile, that pile would be 360 kilometers high, which would be enough to reach from the ground to an orbiting space shuttle.
So, as we tick around to about the year 2010, everything in my life is going really well. I'm a successful author, I'm making money, I'm published all over the world, and there's even talk for the first time that we might make Cherub into a TV series or a movie. And we're still working on that. It's never happened, but we're still working on it. But I now had a problem. The problem was I was running out of ideas because when you start writing a series of books, with the same characters and the same scenarios, it gets harder and harder. So by the time I got to write in the eighth book in the Cherub series, I started to think, you know, oh, I wanna do this. I want my main character to do something or go somewhere. And then it was like, no, nope, I can't do that because James already did that in book four. Or I wanted to do a mission about drugs, but no, I'd already written book two about drugs. So as I went on writing the series, it got harder and harder to do. So even though my fans were enjoying the books and they were making money and they were being really successful, when I got to the 16th and 17th Cherubs books, I decided that would be the end of the Cherub series. Now the Cherub series was over and I needed to decide what to do next. The first thing that I did was I wrote a couple of standalone novels called Killer T and Arctic Zoo. But after I'd done those, I started to think about the fact I'd always written series and I really enjoy writing series of books where you can really develop and explore characters and storylines over a number of books. And I started to think about the Robin Hood legend because I'd always enjoyed Robin Hood movies and Robin Hood books. And I'd always been kind of fascinated by stories and legends around the character of Robin Hood. The other thing that really appealed to me about Robin Hood in the present day is there's lots of talk in the world today about equality. And the, one of the main themes of Robin Hood stories is that he always takes from the rich and gives to the poor. The other really nice and really interesting thing about Robin Hood is that nobody owns Robin Hood. What do I mean by that? Well, most things are owned by the people who create them. So for example, if I wanted to do a story about Mickey Mouse or a Star Wars story, I would need to get permission from the people who created and own those stories, and I would probably have to pay them quite a lot of money. But because Robin Hood is a legend, you don't have to do that. Robin Hood has been around for 600 years and nobody knows who really created it. The very first Robin Hood stories that we know about are poems that were first written in the 1450s to the 1470s. And then as technology progressed and as time moved on, every time a new medium came along, the Robin Hood stories were put out in that medium. So there were Robin Hood ballads, there were Robin Hood plays in Shakespeare time. When the printing press made it economical to print big fat books at a reasonable cost, the first novels were written and some of the very first novels were Robin Hood stories. When books became cheaper still and kids books became popular during the Victorian era, Robin Hood then became a children's character. And this was actually a really interesting point in the Robin Hood era, because up to this point, Robin Hood had been a bandit and he'd generally been portrayed as quite a nasty character. But when they made Robin Hood into more of a children's character in the Victorian era, this was when he got many of his more positive characteristics, including the fact that he took from the rich and gave to the poor. And then as more modern mediums came along, Robin Hood went right along with it, whether it was radio, whether it was movies, whether it was comic books, TV in the 1950s, video games in the 1980s. And even right now today, if you want to come bang up to date, you can log into Fortnite and you can have a Robin Hood character in Fortnite. So everyone can just make their own version of Robin Hood. And I thought this was really great. And the other thing that I really liked about Robin Hood was that it's not just a traditional British thing or it's not just set in medieval times. People all over the world have made hundreds or thousands of different versions of Robin Hood. So for example, there is a Bollywood movie about Robin Hood made in India almost every year. In the Philippines, the most popular television series for five years was called Eyeless Robin Hood, which was a story about a Robin Hood type character living in Manila. And in Canada, if you want to be really crazy and really wacky, they made an animated series called Rocket Robin Hood, which was about a version of Robin Hood who piloted a spaceship and lived in the year 3000. So anyone can make their own version of Robin Hood. And now I'm going to give you a quick reading from my version of Robin Hood. 
author's note, the characters in this book are fictional and a lot more bouncy than real people. Please don't try to copy any of Robin's stunts. Please don't shoot arrows at people or animals. If you do try something stupid and wind up breaking your legs, don't come running to me. Chapter number one, Mr. Barclay is a nutter. The legend of Robin Hood begins in Loxley High School on a Wednesday afternoon. It was the middle of lunch break and pepperoni pizza and buttered corn sat heavy in 12 year old Robin's nervous stomach. If we get caught, we're dead. Robin's pal, Alan Adol noted as he shoulder barged double doors. The school was a dump and the boy set off down a corridor lined with vandalized lockers. Mildew on the windows gave the light a greenish tinge and a stink wafted from drains in the girls' bathroom at the far end. The two lads were a contrast. Robin was small but muscly, with scruffy hair and ketchup down his purple school polo shirt. Alan was a neat freak. His gangly frame started with madly expensive basketball boots, whiter than anything in a toothpaste ad, and topped out with an extravagant afro that forced him to duck under doors. Mr. Barclay's a nutter, Alan continued. Craig got two weeks of detention for burping in assembly. Robin smirked at the memory. Craig's vast rolling belch, silencing a guest lecturing on water safety and leaving half the school in hysterical laughter as Mr. Barclay gripped Craig by his collar and dragged him out of the gym. Barclay's on lunch duty on the other side of the school, Robin soothed. And you're just my lookout. All of the benefits, none of the risks. Robin was trying to sound calm, but shuddered when he stopped at a door. It had muddy kick marks and peeling brown paint. The sign read, Mr. Barclay, head of year seven, under which someone had graffitied, abandon hope ye who enter here. Can you get me an A? Alan begged as Robin pulled a neon yellow plastic key out of his pocket. Mate, you can barely add two numbers together. Are you saying I'm thick? Alan accused. Maths isn't one of your strengths, Robin said diplomatically. Nobody's going to believe you got an A. How did you get Mr. Barclay's key anyway? Alan asked. He leaves his keys on the desk in his classroom, Robin explained. I took a close-up photo, then made copies using the 3D printer at my dad's work. My dad's got a 3D printer, Alan said. He only used it once, so basically he spent 500 quid to make a small plastic hedgehog. Your family has got way too much money, Robin said irritably. Can we please concentrate? Keys are normally metal, so Robin worried as he slotted the yellow plastic inside the lock. Some girls ran out of the bathroom. There was a big shriek and one shouted, Give me my hat, moose brain! But they paid the boys no attention. Once they were out of sight, Robin twisted the key in the lock and felt it flex. I am bigger, shall I try? Alan asked. I don't want it to snap, Robin explained. I'm being gentle. There was an alarming scraping sound, but just as Robin thought his efforts were doomed, the bolt made a satisfying thunk. Am I a genius or what? Robin said brightly. We're in. <laughs> Before I go, I'd just like to say that the nice people from the Hay Festival asked me to make a little extension exercise. So there is a worksheet that you can download and it is called Make Your Own Robin Hood. I've been talking about all of the different versions of Robin Hood from around the world and this is a little exercise where you get to fill in some boxes and invent your own version of Robin Hood and you can be as sensible or as crazy as you like. Thank you so much for taking the time to listen to my talk. I really hope you enjoyed it and I hope some of you will go on to read and enjoy some of my books. And before I go, I'd just like to say very good luck to anyone in this audience who would someday like to be a writer themselves. Goodbye. <laughs>